Let's welcome everyone for our uh, series of uh, lightning talks on what the year of open science meant at NOAA Fisheries. And we're going to have a, a series of, of vignettes about our, uh, about our year and beyond. We'll kick off with um, some words from Evan Howell, the Director of the Office of Science and Technology. All right, thanks Eli. Voice check, everything okay? Yep. All right, well, thanks everyone. I'm really excited to be here today and really just to be a part of uh, open science, what's happening in the world and what's happening at fisheries. I think this is something that's a long time coming. It's something that I've said I wish I had earlier in my career. Um, might have been in a very different place right now if something like this had existed. And I want folks to know that in NOAA Fisheries, the science leadership fully supports this growing culture of open science and we'll do whatever we can to, to support it, to have it thrive and grow. I personally believe this will greatly accelerate our ability to produce quality science products to meet an increasing demand that I see coming by resource managers, stakeholders, and community members. I think it's important to allow for more flexible and dynamic resource management models and decision-making in an ever-changing environmental landscape. This will become more important than ever in the coming years. To do this, we need to ensure that we have open and transparent access to data, the tools, and the processes to ensure both science integrity and our capability to reproduce and continue to produce these quality data products and science products in a timely manner. So of course, the concept of open science is important and the rules and the constructs that we create and we share help ensure that there's clarity and focus in this activity as we work together, building the cohorts, training the generations, having the mentoring networks, but all of this really succeeds because of the people involved. And that's who you're going to hear from today, some truly special people in NOAA Fisheries that are really the heart and soul of how this is happening in the agency and I think are, are setting up a system that will, that will thrive for, for years to come. We need these open science champions to really galvanize this culture of sharing, collaboration, and best practices to ensure, as I said, that we have accountability and transparency in our work. So I'm proud to be here today and introduce this great team of people who are leading the charge and galvanizing this lasting culture of open science and NOAA fisheries. And with that, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words, and I'm happy to turn it back to our NOAA fisheries open science lead, Eli Holmes, to start this session describing our year of open science community building at NOAA fisheries. Thanks, Eli. Well, hi, everyone. I am Eli Holmes. As Evan said, I am the lead of our uh, NOAA Fisheries Open Science Initiative. And I took on this role um, in October, so it's fairly new, but I've been involved with open science my entire career. Um, before I took on this role, I was a research scientist at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center for over 25 years, working mainly on endangered species uh, research and also um, risk assessments. So what is the what is uh, NIMFS open science? So NIMFS stands for NOAA Fisheries. The overarching vision is to support the scientists, developers, research managers, and policy analysts within NOAA Fisheries, so within our line office, in fulfilling all the open data, open science, open gover government mandates that affect us. So the NIMFS Open Science is supporting the, the wider goal of open science by supporting our scientists um, and developers, other staff within our agency. So we have all these you know, mandates at the top, but a mandate by itself doesn't make change possible and doesn't make adoption of open science and open data possible. The role of NIMS Open Science is to connect with the people at the base, the people who are doing the science uh, within our line offense, who will be making the data uh, available, who are making the science available, and understand things from their perspective and understand the constraints that they face. Because we can have all these mandates at the top, but if whatever we are asking of people is not possible, or not easy, um, so doable given the time they have, then, well, you just, it doesn't work. 
I mean, you can't, I mean, you can make all the mandates you want, but if it's not possible, it won't happen. So how do you determine what is possible um, and what is, what is easy? Well, you need to connect with the individual people who are um, doing the work. And our, um, so NIMS Open Science does a lot of this connecting with the individual people, and you'll be hearing from those people today. And we're trying to understand from them, what are your actual barriers? Because oftentimes when we hear about open science, you think that the barriers that people don't want to do open science, or so they're reluctant. I would say within federal agencies, um, that's not the case. We're civil servants. We are, um, it's our job to uh, make our science open. But um, often within a federal agency, there are many barriers uh, in practice that make it really hard for people to engage in open science. For example, the technical difficulties that we saw today where we can't download a particular piece of software. So that's kind of a, a really common kind of barrier. So. Uh, NIMS Open Science has um, three big areas of focus, community building and skill building. Today, you're going to hear from four different uh, perspectives of teams that went through our team-based program, helped develop skills. Over 300 um, staff now have gone through this program. You're going to hear from uh, two uh, groups working in this um, area of infrastructure and tools and governance. Um, it's really important for us to be able to do the open science work. We need access to the tools. And then um, a third area of focus is uh, communication. So we don't want to have siloing where one group is doing one thing and the other people who could use those that information, um, they don't know about it. All right. So with that, I am going to kick us off with um, one of these stories from our uh, OpenScape's uh, team building workshops. So Megsy, just tell me when you want me to advance. Yes, and Eli, I apologize in advance for all the animations I put in here. Mm -hmm. um, hi everyone, I am Margaret Seipel, I go by Megsy, and please uh, advance the first animation, Eli. Oh God, this is gonna take forever. So I work at the Alaska Fishery Science Center, and I'm just gonna take you on a brief journey of how our open data science journey has gone in the last three-ish years. So setting the scene with this, the Alaska Center before 2020, we had some people using version control, um, sharing, but primarily within research groups. And we had these expanding needs for automation project management, and also for psychological safety. Um, throughout this timeline, I'm going to use the metaphor of a forest. So roll with me. Next animation, please. So that was the scenario before 2020. And then COVID happened. And um, the COVID pandemic sort of ripped through our work practices, much like a wildfire, um, destroying a lot of the tools that we once depended on and, and sort of forcing us to do new things. Next slide, please. Or next animation. Um, in 2021, we, uh, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center hosted an OpenScapes Champions workshop. And this was a, a workshop focused on improving skills and psychological safety to build teams and help them do open data science better. Um, the Northwest Center invited staff from other centers, including the Northeast, Southeast, and Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And we also, at the center in a separate effort, had a, a, um, started working on official guidance for better hybrid and better and more inclusive hybrid work practices. Next, please. Then in 2022, we brought OpenScape's champions to AFSC and hosted two different cohorts here at our science center. And at the same time, our team for inclusion, diversity, and equity was making an effort to improve psychological safety at the center and uh, host trainings for staff and supervisors. Next. Then in 2023, we 
participated in this cross-center OpenScapes mentor group for people who are interested in hosting their own OpenScapes workshops and advancing open data science that way. And then we had additional trainings, you know, from Tide to improve psychological safety, to, tra to train supervisors how to create psychologically safe uh, conditions in their groups. And um, we really expanded a lot of our open data science practices that I'll talk about in a little bit. Next animation, please. And now here we are in the year, the official year of open science. Um, we have some ongoing seaside chats. These are regular chats where we get together and talk about our workflows and ask questions. Um, and we're also working on improving the security and making sure we're compliant with, with NOAA security requirements using GitHub, which is the primary tool that we use to, to sort of do all of our open science things. Uh, next animation slash slide should go to the next one. Uh, I should mention, we also have several groups that are using GitHub to do project management, make reproducible reports, and several other sort of standard uh, open data science practices. So using the same metaphor of a forest canopy, we have now um, a set of things that are big and expansive like the forest canopy and flashy and easy for other people to see and access. Um, these include things like automated reports, including stock assessments. Um, and they also include publicly available data and publicly available software. We have the trees that sort of structure us and keep us in place. And that is our collaborative project management, which we do through GitHub projects. Um, we have the main trunk, which is our collaboration with other centers, including um, software development and the development of general work and workflow tools. And then I think of the water at the bottom of this image as the sort of what feeds this whole structure. And that's the psychological safety that's linked to the way that we do our team practices and, and our culture. Next. And this has led to three big pillars that I want to mention briefly. One is just that we have, I think, improved a lot our communication with collaborators, with our regional office, and with other science centers and the public. We also have upwards of 200 active GitHub users across the center. That's across four divisions and our IT group. Um, and most importantly, we have these new avenues of communication with each other and with the public. And much like a forest, we will change in the future. We're not sure quite how, but this has been a really transformative last four years for the Alaska Center. Thank you. Thank you, Megzi. So next up, you will hear from Amanda who's from the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center. Sound check. You're good. All right, aloha everyone. My name is Amanda Bradford and I'm a research ecologist at the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Community is an especially important resource here in the Hawaiian Islands, both for the Hawaiian people and for those of us grateful to be residents. Community can be a lifeline when you live on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I'm here today to talk about building an open science community at the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center, or PIFS. Here at PIFS, we are far away and spread out with a jurisdiction that spans across the Pacific. Like other government offices, siloed working has been the default at PIFS, but this can feel especially isolating when your office is further siloed within the agency by distance and time zones. Next slide, Eli. So this was me um, three years ago, strung out after 10 years of using an inefficient workflow and disjointed code to repeatedly estimate the abundance of up to 24 whale and dolphin species using ship baseline transect data. I was desperate to make a change, but I did not have a clear vision for what change could look like. I had heard about open science, but I wasn't sure how to operationalize it and felt alone. Then I learned that NOAA Fisheries staff from the Northeast and later Northwest and Alaska had participated in the OpenScapes Champions Program and had found it transformational. In late 2021, I reached out to OpenScapes and to folks at all those centers to find out how to bring OpenScapes to PIFs. The timing was right because Eli and others had just formed the NEMS OpenScapes Initiative and were working to organize concurrent Champions cohorts across NOAA Fisheries. I just needed to find out who in PIFs would want to participate. Uh, next slide, Eli. 
So I distributed a survey in early 2022 scoping interest in OpenScapes, but with the broader aim of forming a community of open science practitioners at PIFS. Over 50 people replied to the survey and were generally enthusiastic about forming a community of practice. At the time, only six respondents had heard of OpenScapes, but during that fall, 22 PIF staff participated in the concurrent champions cohorts. What I realized over that year was that there were actually several PIF staff committed to open science practices, but the synergy of the NIMS Open Science or OpenScapes initiative and the experience of the champions program helped us to find each other and grow a community. Since that time, more PIF staff have joined the NIMS OpenScape Mentors Community and other NOAA Fisheries Open Science Initiatives. A few of us also established an Open Science Corner for PIF's biweekly newsletter, where we share announcements, resources, and efficiency tips. And earlier this year, we organized the inaugural Pacific Islands Region Open Science Showcase, where 10 PIF staff across our three research divisions each gave a lightning talk on their open science project. And next slide, Eli. So you saw how I felt three years ago. Well, this is me now. As a quantitative ecologist, I wish I could report exact metrics on how this community building has changed things for the better, but all I can say is it has. I can see it in my own life when I use the new R package we developed for cetacean line transect abundance estimation and when I co-work with my work team. I can see it when a colleague reaches out to a colleague in another division for ideas on how to approach an analysis. I can see it when a colleague is inspired by a tool designed by a, by a colleague at another center and is able to adapt her code and develop an anal analogous tool specific to our region. Here are some things I have learned over the last three years. One, practicing open science and especially being part of an open science community fills my cup as a government scientist. And y'all know how easily bureaucracy loves to drain our cups. Two, you don't have to be an open science expert to help build or be part of an open science community. I wasn't an expert then and I'm not one now. We all need help and resources to learn and get better. That's the point of community. Three, if a community practice isn't working, don't give it up, change it up. After staff from my division participated in OpenScapes, we started a weekly co-working hour. It was well attended in the beginning, but after a year, it was only two or three of us regularly meeting, mostly using the time to catch up. We put the co-working on pause, but encouraged folks to continue to reach out if they needed help and we could schedule on-demand co-working. And amazingly, folks reached out. Within a month, we had well-attended co-working sessions on using GitHub, Porto, and mapping in R. Finally, we need more leadership buy-in and support to transition to open science practices. There is no doubt about that. In the meantime, though, we have each other, a community at the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center and across NOAA Fisheries. I live on an island, but I no longer work as an island. And for both experiences, I am most grateful. Mahalo for your time. Okay, thank you, Amanda. And um, is Brian on the phone? I think he might not have been able to. All right, so uh, for our next talk, we will have um, Josh, uh, Josh London presenting for uh, Brian. Are you there, Josh? Yeah, uh, sound check, all good? All good. Okay. Uh, sorry that uh, Brian isn't able to give this talk. I know he's worked on it um, quite a bit this last week and um, would have been a really great uh, voice and ambassador for the work that we've been doing here. But I'm, I'm really proud to step in and, um, and share our story here at the Alaska Fishery Science Center, specifically uh, the Marine Mammal Laboratory, about how open science has transformed our ability to work on um, uh, Alaska marine mammal stock assessments. So my name is Josh London. I'm a wildlife biologist here at the Marine Mammal Laboratory at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And uh, Brian Faley, Tony Orr, Aaron Richmond, Rod Tao, Nancy Young, and Millie Brower have all been a key part of this team over the last year. And for those of you who may not know, um, Marine Mammal Stock Assessment Reports, or SARS as we call them, provide updates of population stock status, assess the risks of human caused mortalities and injuries, and are used to guide management actions and are required by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. These rep reports are produced by NOAA Fisheries Science Center authors for three regions in the United States, Alaska with 48 stocks, the Pacific with 85 stocks, and the Atlantic Gulf of Mexico with about 116 stocks. 
We're excited to share our experience integrating open science principles into the stock assessment report workflows. Our small team here at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center um, have each um, contributed data and analyses used in stock assessments as one of our primary job duties because developing the actual reports is a small but important and repetitive part of that work. We sought to really improve the workflow and mo most importantly, um, make that workflow reproducible. Uh, let's go with slide two, Eli. So stock assessment reports are produced using a variety of software tools currently. They undergo uh, multiple reviews, edits, approvals, and public comment periods. They're often um, overlapping versions and draft or review phases, and revision suggestions or edits become dispersed across uh, many hard-to-find emails. And because so many authors are involved, there are often complex file storage and tracking systems that are developed. Uh, this is common with many other work throws across the agency where multiple authors share multiple draft versions through multiple emails using naming conventions we're all familiar with, like final, final, use this one, only to be followed by final, final, no, use this one. Um, those workflows are often unique, and while accomplishing the task, uh, limit our efficiency and, and reproducibility, increasing workloads, and, and definitely do not get uh, the seal of approval. So you've heard about OpenScapes from, from others and, and the champions cohorts that many of us participated in. As part of our uh, OpenScapes training, our group formed and we sought to reframe stock assessment report production from ReMammals as a collaborative effort to streamline the process and manage multiple contributions, all while maintaining consistency with kind of the overall NIMP stock assessment report requirements. Uh, slide three, Eli. This process has been extremely iterative and, and intentional. Um, we didn't really know what it was going to look like in the end, and we're still developing it today. Uh, we tested many different workflows um, using open source software, and what we've kind of settled on is one that um, did indeed improve efficiency, reproducibility, and project management. Um, R and Quarto provide a framework for writing, code execution, production of tables and figures, and outputs in multiple file formats. Um, we rely on Zotero for citation tracking and um, sharing a collaborative bibliography. GitHub, as you've heard, has been a pivotal part of this process providing a project management environment and a suite of other tools for a collaborative workspace and tracking our versions um, as we develop each stock assessment report. At the lower left is a close up from the Seller CLAR import report of a Quarto Markdown document um, running in our studio that integrates text and code and can be rendered into multiple formats. Um, we also were able to incorporate contributions from multiple authors and the version control and everything is all maintained through our shared GitHub repository. Uh, the next slide, Eli. So um, we've successfully achieved a workflow that that kind of met our initial objectives. And this year, we're happy to report that two stock assessment reports were completed using our workflow, and at least five are underway for the next year. Like I said, this is a continuing process, and we still have much work to do. We'll continue to grow it by creating author guidelines and sharing this process with other authors and seek their their feedback. Um, we've learned many things, like Amanda mentioned in, in her talk, incorporating GitHub was the primary tool that allowed us to improve workflow, version control, file management, and automating many of the processes. We found there's really no template for how to incorporate open science objectives into pro projects. Because the way we've always done things is comfortable and seemingly easier, it is important to recognize that changing mindsets and practices takes time, effort, and team building. Open science is awesome, but it isn't free in time or money. Buy-in from supervisors to allow that time is essential, and we're grateful to have been given that support from our division leadership. Agency-level support and funds, for example, GitHub Enterprise licenses, GitHub training, are essential to foster the growth of open science culture in the workplace. Lastly, this was a grassroots effort that came from our own initiative, recognizing a need for improvement, and we took it on as a team endeavor. The transformative part of the process was this team building and collaboration that fostered innovation and encouraged discovery. That was the key to our success. We're really grateful to be where we're at now and thank you for your attention. And again, so sorry that Brian wasn't here to present. Thanks, Josh, for stepping in uh, last minute for Brian. 
And next up, we'll have uh, Vivian telling a story from the other side of the country, from the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Thank you, Eli. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. All right, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Vivian Matter. I'm the branch chief of the Data Analysis and Assessment Support Branch in the Sustainable Fisheries Division of the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. I'm excited to share the various ways our branch has utilized open science principles and tools introduced to us through the OpenScapes program. Our division is responsible for assessing the status of our region's fisheries, providing reliable scientific advice that is needed to inform fisheries management to enhance the stewardship of our living marine resources. Our branch is responsible for producing fisheries dependent analytical data products used as inputs into fishery stock assessments conducted in the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. Our branch was established in 2021 as a result of an organizational realignment at the center. Data analysts who were previously geographically aligned in the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico and often siloed from their counterparts found themselves in a brand new branch that was functionally aligned. In this new structure, our branch was challenged to standardize and streamline our analytical approaches and documentation after decades of regional isolation. Uh, this required examining regional differences in analyses, standardizing when possible, establishing best practices, and, doc and automating those approaches. As you can imagine, this was not an easy transition. Luckily for us, OpenScapes held several cohorts at the Science Center around this time, and we began to utilize GitHub to share knowledge, leverage experience, collaborate on scripts, and streamline our processes. These are a list of our branch's current analytical processes with GitHub repositories within our enterprise organization. Each repository houses standard code for each data analysis, including code for exploratory data analyses, output figures and tables, and automated reports. Issues are used to track code improvements and discussions concerning the analytical product. This structure has helped onboard new data analysts and more easily cross-train employees to ensure continuity of operations. It also provides transparency and access to our work and improves cross-branch and cross-divisional collaboration. Another function of our branch is stock assessment support. This entails coordinating data provision and managing the project schedule for each fishery stock assessment project. We create a GitHub repository for each assessment. Here we coordinate data providers, data analysts, and stock assessment analysts across four divisions at the Science Center. Issues are used for each data product or topic where discussions are summarized and feedback is solicited. In this way, discussions are transparent and no one has to go digging through their emails to find information. Project boards are used to track data and ensure the project stays on schedule. We also build a public facing web page, which is utilized to communicate the parameters of the stock assessment to all data mm -hmm. providers, both internal and external to the Science Center. This is possible because of our GitHub enterprise organization. Finally, we use GitHub for branch project management. Our branch project board tracks issues and items from multiple repositories across the organization, including the stock assessment repositories I just discussed. It allows us to see everything we have on our plate in one spot. This has streamlined our branch meetings and has improved communications. If anyone wants to check on the status of an item, it's here at their fingertips. Utilizing these open science principles and tools, our branch has made significant progress on meeting our goals and objectives, despite the many challenges faced during and after our center's realignment. Of all branches, sorry, uh, through the dedicated work of all of my branch's employees, we have built a community of collaboration and culture with an emphasis on reproducibility, transparency, open communication, and continuous improvement. Thank you, Vivian. And yeah. next up, um, we're gonna hear from Catherine, who's gonna talk mm -hmm. about our GitHub Enterprise, you, the last two talks have mentioned that a bit, and Vivian talked quite a bit about that. And now you hear about how we govern that uh, enterprise organization. 
think they like them. Are you talking? Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you now. Oh, excellent. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hi, so sorry for the technological challenges. Um, so I'm here, like Eli said, to talk about kind of our open science governance and specifically um, with respect to GitHub. Um, and so about a year ago when we started, um, GitHub use was already prevalent within NOAA fisheries. Uh, and we've had staff that have used GitHub for over a decade. However, there were some issues that we identified. Uh, one issue was that there, uh, you know, we work for a government agency, and so we're subject to a lot of IT policies. Um, and there were IT policies created that had no connection with user needs. Um, and so this was very confusing for our GitHub users at NOAA Fisheries. Um, each uh, NOAA Fisheries office also created their own rules and IT policies around GitHub use. And so this was also confusing for staff um, when they, you know, talk to staff at other offices. And finally, it was difficult to find NOAA Fisheries work on GitHub. And this was because our work is spread out um, amongst many different organizations and user accounts, and there wasn't a common place to put it. So this made it hard for us to find it as NOAA Fisheries staff, as well as for the broader open science community. Uh, Eli, next slide, please. So to start addressing these challenges, uh, we within NOAA Fisheries created a cross office group of GitHub users and IT professionals. Uh, we started this group about a year ago and we have monthly meetings and some asynchronous um, channels of communication. So I wanna talk about both the challenges and success we've experienced. And um, I think like a lot of the work you hear about here, this is a continuous process and there's still a lot of work to do. Some of the challenges we faced have been with coordination. Uh, this is a group of about 20 plus individuals. And so it's required a lot of coordination to get us started um, and definitely more work in the short term for the group. Um, in terms of better um, for uh, GitHub, NOAA Fisheries. However, some of the successes we've experienced, I think are really meaningful. Uh, so the first one is we now have standardized practices across our NOAA Fisheries offices for how to use GitHub. And the second uh, success we've had is we've created GitHub organizations for each office that we're um, starting to migrate work over to. And so this will make our presence on GitHub more easy to find, um, both for us internally, as well as the broader open science community. And finally, I think the biggest impact has been increased communication between our offices, um, and including both um, IT departments and GitHub users who are typically developers and scientists. These channels of communication didn't exist before, and so it's really meaningful to um, have them. Uh, for instance, I've seen a lot of great troubleshooting when we've encountered technical problems, um, and in terms of setting standards, uh, it's been really helpful. So like I said, this is still a work in progress, um, but I think it will benefit, benefit our open science um, enterprise at um, NOAA Fisheries as a whole. Thank you, Catherine. Um, next up, we're going to hear from uh, Christine, who's going to talk about one of our teams that uh, is developing uh, software using open uh, source and open science practices. Uh, thanks, Eli. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a fishery software library that we're developing within the Office of Science and Technology at NOAA Fisheries. And so we aim to provide a library of tools and resources that adhere to a common set of standards that facilitate op interoperability. Um, we de develop it through a collaborative community effort using open science approaches, and we use agile development processes hmm. to incorporate continuous feedback. 
Um, I'll talk about what motivated the project, what we've done, and where we're going. Um, so starting with the motivation, um, we have uh, no, we at NOAA Fisheries have hundreds of fishery stock assessments that inform science-based management for living marine resources. And these assessments use many software tools to come up with these recommendations. And though the tools currently in use are working well, the science of fisheries and human dimensions affecting fisheries continues to move forward. Um, so many of these focus areas that we have, we outlined in this 2018 implementation guide. And in parallel to the science progress, we've seen a lot of progress in the data and computer science industry by improving software and programming languages, um, increasing standards for our packages and adding new features to version control systems like Git and GitHub. Um, and so as you've heard from many of the previous speakers um, across the agency, we have scientists adopting these practices as part of the rollout of open science across NOAA. Um, we're also looking on how to improve public access to research results as PAR 2.0. And so to bring kind of all of these policy and practical recommendations and advances together, we needed a modern and collaborative uh, research and design workflow for fisheries software tools. Um, so what we did is assemble a group of fishery scientists and software engineers across the U.S. to design and implement the library, which we call the Fisheries Integrated Modeling System. We gathered requirements across regions and planned out needed features. Um, we undertook an agile development workflow to develop a beta version. And then we benchmarked this beta version against some existing software tools that we currently use for assessments. Um, the community needed to learn and share a lot of skills uh, like software development and version control. And then we also had some uh, experienced software engineers on the team that needed to talk more to the fishery scientists about the management needs. So they were sharing across disciplines through this process. Um, like Megzi said earlier, we started during the pandemic. And so we had to figure out how to do this all together virtually for several years before we were able to meet in person. And so um, we really couldn't have done that without the collaborative infrastructure being built at NOAA for open science, like OpenScapes, the GitHub governance team and the R users group. Um, so I'll close with our next steps. Um, we have a beta version of the software library, but we have both technical and social challenges in front of us to solve before we can bring this into an operational version. So while we continue develop and extending the library, we wanna work with regional scientists to test and use the software so that we create a continuous feedback and improvement loop. But that's gonna mean we have to be even more rigorous about how we deal with change management and collaborative development. And so, but we're hoping that by paying the price now, when it comes to roll out of this tool, it'll be really representative of what the system users and the science users need across the US, which will create a clearer research to operations pipeline and allow us to understand and plan for maintenance of the software library going forward. Um, and we really will continue to work lockstep with all of the other open science movement happening across NOAA fisheries to, to change culture amongst the scientists and roll out the library. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. And we are going to close our session with two stories uh, from our integrated ecosystem assessment uh, teams, one from the East Coast and one from the West Coast. And these teams um, integrate all these ideas together. So we'll start off with uh, Carissa. Hi, can you hear me okay? You sound great. Awesome. So my name's Carissa Gervasi. I'm a NOAA affiliate working with the Southeast Fisheries Science Center in Miami, Florida. And I'm going to give a quick overview of how we are learning and working together through open science in the Gulf of Mexico Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Program. The IEA program is a national initiative that supports ecosystem-based management of marine resources. A large part of the IEA framework shown in the center of this slide is developing ecosystem indicators that can be used to assess progress towards and risks to meeting important management objectives. While these indicators vary regionally, methods for calculating and presenting them to various audiences can be applicable nationwide. 
Born out of ideas sparked by OpenScape's training. And if you can click once, Eli. Brittany, Brendan, and I initiated Gulf IEA Seaside Chats in 2022, which are monthly virtual meetings where we discuss how we can create better IEA products using open science tools. Importantly, these chats bring together people from several line offices who are working on IEA projects, giving people space to connect who otherwise might not have the opportunity to. And our goals are threefold. Next slide. Um, first, to learn both from other members of the Gulf IEA as well as from other IEA regions. This we've accomplished by sharing tutorials, working through coding problems together, and bringing in guest speakers from other regions to talk about their workflows and products. For example, sea surface temperature is a common ecosystem indicator used throughout the IEA regions. In the Northeast, IEA scientists have developed a streamlined automated method for pulling SST data and creating seasonal spatial SST anomaly maps. During a seaside chat meeting, we worked to adapt the code that was available on the Northeast region's GitHub page to our region. Sharing code and methods on GitHub allows us to all learn from each other and create products that let our stakeholders easily compare important indicators between regions. Next slide. Our second goal is to automate creation of ecosystem status reports or ESRs. These reports include time series figures of indicators as well as text summarizing trends. In their current form, they're incredibly time consuming to create and update. ESRs can contain 50 or more indicators, all of which are currently developed separately by individual scientists. Reports are then compiled using Word or Google Docs and manually pasting figures and text. By taking advantage of open science tools like GitHub and Quarto, we're working to automate the process of compiling and analyzing indicator data, creating plots and figures, and publishing reports. This will allow ESRs to be more regularly updated so that stakeholders always have the latest information with which to make informed management decisions. Next slide. Finally, we strive to innovate and develop new ways to share our results and products with stakeholders using tools like dashboards and shiny apps. Despite these efforts being somewhat secondary to our main job requirements, our Seaside Chat meetings have continued to host a steady following for over a year. Part of the reason I think we've been successful is because while we encourage informal information sharing and co-working, we're collectively working towards clear goals. And the things that we're learning, like how to create reports in Quarto, are applicable to projects beyond the IEA program. Having a space to meet regularly where everyone is welcome to join and share their ideas and knowledge has had incredible benefits for our IEA program. And we would encourage other groups at NOAA and at other agencies to give it a try. Thank you. Thank you, Carissa. And now we'll head to the um, other side of the country and finish up with uh, another um, integrated ecosystem assessment story from Lynn. Hi, can you hear me? Sounds great. Good. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video just because I'm not too sure of my connection. So I'm going to share how the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team increased the efficiency of our workflow by converting to open science tools to generate our yearly ecosystem status report. And thanks to Carissa, the previous speaker who gave a really nice description of integrated ecosystem assessments and ecosystem status reports. So this was a team effort. I'm Lindy Witt from the South Fisheries Southwest Fisheries Science Center and the rest of the team, all from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center are Greg Williams, Nick Tolomeri, and Chris Daly. Greg and I were both part of o OpenScape's cohort, so this work stems from those experiences we had as well. So looking at the map on the right, the CCIEA region covers the entire West Coast and includes an immensely diverse set of habitats, conditions, species, and human populations. Next slide, please. So really briefly about the uh, ESR 
our ESR. The CCIEA reports annually to the Pacific Fisheries Management Council and other stakeholders on the state of the ecosystem within the California current system. We do this by synthesizing over 650 indicators on climate, habitat, ecology, and human well being. And these data are provided by over 90 collaborators from various NOAA fisheries, state, and NGO partners. Next slide. We really have only six to eight weeks to go from calling from the data, calling for the data in December to presenting the report in early March. And that's shown on the timeline in the center of the slide. Our previous workflow is shown on the top and our newly implemented open science workflow is on the bottom. Previously, data and metadata were submitted via email and inconsistent file formats, which required a lot of manual hand editing by data managers. We then uploaded metadata into a database that was accessible to web pages, but to very few humans. We now have an online data and metadata uploader. We require submission of tidy data, and we have an automatic process to upload the data to ERDAP. We've also made the CCIE metadata into its own ERDAP database, so it's now accessible from anywhere and by anyone or any process. Previously, the report generation was also a manual effort where figure insertion and cross-referencing were just done by hand. Now the ESR text is generated collaboratively in our Markdown Bookdown, and which is soon to be Quarto, and it's versioned in GitHub. Within the R code, our process is to automatically generate and insert figures as new data is submitted, and the entire workflow is reproducible so, it's easy, so it easily transfers from year to year. Finally, we've implemented a project management system on GitHub to track the progress of our workflow throughout the ESR season, and it's also a place where we can keep notes on improvements for the future. But best of all, this new, more efficient workflow leaves a lot more time for actually doing science. Next slide. So to summarize, by taking the time to implement an open science workflow, we have more timely reporting, more consistent project and data management, more efficient report writing, and importantly, a more fair workflow data and products. But we're not done, and we see a lot of room for improvement. Our future vision, is to continue to adopt to new, to, to new open science platforms and tools and improve in their interoperability, to scale our products to specific regions and diverse stakeholders, and to continue to move toward more, more dynamic web-based reporting with products like our integrative info, interactive infographic shown at the right. Next slide. And I'll just leave you with a look at some of our current products and a QR code where you can check them out. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you to all our speakers. And um, <clears throat> kind of amazing, we pulled it out with, uh, uh, despite our technical difficulties in the beginning. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Because we started a bit late, we, um, we've run pretty close to 2 p.m. So we're not going to uh, take a discussion because I worry if we started talking, we would uh, run into the next sessions that are talking starting in four minutes. Um, so yeah, thank you all. And thanks to all the speakers who shared their stories today. <laughs>